Hi. This session deals with the shift in attitudes towards immigration in the United States in the early 20th century. It's an interesting session because it deals with how immigration became a racial issue in the United States. In 1924, Congress passed the Johnson-Reed, or Immigration Restriction Act, legislating that American citizenship was ultimately a question of racial fitness. The law defined as American the mixture of ethnic backgrounds in 1890. It prohibited anyone originating from outside of Europe or Africa from becoming citizens of the United States. It was overturned only in 1965, this law. It was praised by Hitler and Mein Kampf and inspired the 1933 uh, Nuremberg laws, the infamous laws uh, passed uh, in Hitler's Germany. Who am I, first of all? I'm Dr. Kevin Ewell. I'm a senior lecturer in American studies at the University of Sunderland. So my specialist subject is the history of race in the United States in the 20th century. And this lecture is what I would give to first year university students. Um, and uh, it's also the subject of a book that I hope to bring out uh, next year on the 1924 Immigration Act. Who are you? Hopefully you know that already. But if you don't, this is, you are an A or AS level student studying American history. This lecture. I, I've just said is based on a lecture that I give to first year undergraduates. So I'll tell you again. In terms of structure, first I'm going to talk about immigration to the United States in the 19th century. Second, the new immigration from 1890. Third, international events that affected attitudes towards immigration. Fourth, the campaign for normalcy and the rise of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. Fifth, the Immigration Act of 1924. And finally, uh, immigration in the post-war period. The United States, of course, is a nation of immigrants. All but Native Americans are immigrants in the United States. Up until the 20th century, immigration was encouraged and generally seen as a positive thing. The inscription at the bottom of the Statue of Liberty uh, that you can see up in the slide is a poem by Emma Lazarus. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. And the United States is an interesting uh, place because it's a land where anybody who shared the political values of the country, the republicanism, the religious freedom, the democracy, the independence, might become American. This was, and in some ways is, still a radical concept. One is born English or Scottish or French or Danish. It is very difficult, if not impossible, to become any of these nationalities. In the United States, you can still become an American, and just about anyone can become American. It's that great promise that separates the United States uh, from the rest of the world. However, right from the start, there were exceptions to who could become American. The Naturalization Act of 1790 stipulated that, quote, any alien, being a free white person, may be admitted to become a citizen of the United States. And according to Roger Daniels, who is one of the best authors on this subject, uh, the intent of the 1790 Act was to deny citizenship to African Americans, free or slave, and indentured servants of any color. So it's not just African Americans. Uh, the free white person's uh, aspect was very important. The 1790 Naturalization Act was taken uh, from the ver earlier state acts uh, that stipulated uh, very similar things. There is another exception with the Know Nothing Party. Know Nothing Party came from 1845 uh, to 1860 approximately. Uh, and it talked about Native Americans, not as in Native American uh, as in Indians, uh, but Native Americans against what it felt was a huge tide of Catholic Irish mostly uh, coming to the shores in the 1840s and 50s. And the Know Nothing Party, it was called that because basically when, uh, when it was first uh, begun, it, it, it 
tried to uh, manipulate the two uh, existing, existing parties um, at that stage, the Whigs and uh, the Democratic Republicans, and it tried uh, to, um, to manipulate these, and when anybody asked uh, what it was about, it would say, uh, the person would say, I know nothing about it, uh, which of course was a lie, but it became called the Know Nothing Party. It actually stood as a party on its own in uh, the 1856 election, and uh, was directed at the large numbers of Irish who came to the United States in uh, the years of famine. Uh, huge amounts of Irish uh, people came, and it, it had a very much a Protestant tinge to it. it. It was directed against Catholics as much as it was against the Irish. And the Know Nothing Party is another exception uh, to the welcome of immigration. However, this wasn't directed exactly against immigrants, even if it was a nativist movement. It was directed against uh, the political power of immigrants. And this is what it was very much worried about, was political power of the immigrants, rather than stopping the immigration itself. Anti-Irish propaganda, as I show you the slide, it's an amazing how uh, the term white has changed over the years, and in fact, people didn't, in the United States in the 1840s and 50s, portrayed the Irish uh, as not as white, but as a race in between. Uh, and as you can see from this slide, the anti-Irish propaganda, this was from Harper's Magazine, um, and it shows uh, that the Iberian, Irish Iberian, was uh, talked about in the same um, uh, breath as the Negroes, and it was very much uh, as delineated from uh, what was considered white at the time. We have another exception coming with Chinese, and this was the first significant um, act that prevented immigration into the United States. And this was the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act. It was a blatantly racial act. Uh, however, the author of one of the best works on American nativism, John Hyam, um, dismisses the attack on the Chinese as a regional thing. So it was very much a California thing. The Chinese began coming out to California in the year of the gold rush, that's 1849, and uh, numbers of them came um, after the gold rush uh, to work on the railways, and in many ways, uh, they built, uh, to a large extent, the Western railways in the United States. Uh, they were objected to by labor who felt they could live too cheaply and therefore uh, should be sent back. Uh, they didn't want coolie labor coming uh, to, uh, that might lower the wages of uh, Native Americans. And so therefore, in the spring of 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed by Congress and signed into law by President Chester A. Arthur. And this act provided an absolute 10-year moratorium on Chinese labor immigration. It was renewed and then made permanent in 1902. The real campaign against uh, immigration uh, and took on a new character after 1890. Uh, and in the new immigration, from 1850 to 1930, the foreign born population of the United States increased from 2.2 million to 14.2 million, reflecting large scale immigration from Europe during most of this period. And beginning in 1890, the character of US immigration changed, according to many authors, and I have problems with this particular way of looking at it, but I'll talk about that. Prior to 1890, the majority of people came from Northern and Western Europe. That is from England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, uh, from Holland, uh, from some from France, but many, many from Germany. Germany uh, providing uh, uh, probably the largest single ethnic group um, at this stage. This was Northern and Western European um, coming before 1890, whereas, uh, between 1890 and 1924, most of the immigrants came from Southern and Eastern Europe. And in the eyes of many authors, this makes a real uh, division. Um, what is interesting, and what John Hyam makes an excellent point, uh, he says there's a division, that there's no real delineation between old and new stock until after the peak numbers of so-called new immigrants came. So, at the very peak year, 1907, when uh, Italians uh, from, especially Sicilians, when Slavs, uh, when Jews fleeing the pogroms in Russia all came to the United States, nobody noticed their special character and nobody commented on uh, the character of, of this immigration as being 
any very particularly different. It was more after the First World War, in a period that I'll talk about in a second, then people began to point to the character of new immigrants. Uh, and it's, it's interesting that nobody said that they were unassimilable until um, after the sort of fears about immigrants came, um, came about. New stock immigration, average annual immigration from Northern and Western Europe between 1907 and 1914 was 176,983. And just to give you an indication of what uh, many of these authors and contemporary uh, uh, observers pointed to, the average annual immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe between 1907 and 1914 was 685,531. So it's uh, approximately four to one um, that uh, the Southern and Eastern European um, new stock immigration came and uh, to the old stock immigration. As I say, this didn't present uh, undue uh, problems until after the fact. And it, what I want to talk about now is racial fears and other concerns. In 1893, the Immigration Restriction League is formed by a group of Boston patricians. Uh, its central concern is racial, that unfit races are threatening the existing Americans. Uh, and this is, uh, academics are getting involved in this and they're saying, look, uh, there's simply not enough children uh, being born. And this racial fear comes very much top down. I can't emphasize that, that enough. It is top down, it, the racial thinking is coming from a fear about the others, uh, this, this kind of uh, stampede of very fecund uh, groups that are coming in and uh, threatening Native Americans.